First of all, first of all uh, energy metabolism of the brain is a whole organ. It's important to note that the human brain constitutes 2% of the body weight, yet energy consuming processes that ensure proper brain function account for about 25% of total body glucose utilization. And the second paradigm is that glucose is the obligatory energy substrate of the brain, so it's oxidized to CO2 and water through glycolysis, uh, the tricarboxic uh, cyclic acid cycle, and uh, uh, phosphorylation. An important note here is that the ratio, the brain CO2 oxygen ratio, the respiratory quotient is higher, so it's one, uh, than in all other organ, organs, and so that there is a higher glucose utilization in the brain. Uh, what you see here, uh, I think this is a, a very important slide, and it's about the coupling of neuronal activity, uh, cerebral blood flow, and energy metabolism. And this has been nicely uh, reviewed recently by Reichel, uh, who with Fox has worked a lot on this concept. And when you do physiological stimulation of the human visual cortex, what occurs, as has been shown, is that you increase cerebral blood flow. And you have also uh, an increase in glucose utilization. But the increase in glucose utilization here is about 30 to 40 percent, and you don't have a commensurate increase in CMRO2, which goes up of about 6 percent here. And this is what we call the brain metabolic uncoupling, meaning that there is an increased supply of oxygen by flowing blood, which exceeds the increased local demand for oxygen, and so that there is additional glucose, which is utilized during neuronal activation, and that can be processed through glycolysis. And this uh, is uh, a summary of this concept, where when you have an increase in blood flow and glucose utilization, it goes actually up higher for glucose, these accounting for aerobic glycolysis, so it's so-called normal glycolysis or hyperglycolysis, and it goes higher than with oxygen cons consumption. Now, the pathways of, of brain glucose utilization. Uh, you have here a brief summary of glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, which are the main pathways of brain glucose utilization. And energy for brain work is produced in the form of ATP. And glucose here is available from flowing blood as well. So it's, of course, very important to note that the amount of glucose in the brain is very highly dependent on blood glucose, on glucose available in the systemic circulation. Also from glycogen, although the brain is an organ compared to other organs which has reduced availability of glycogen. And it's stored in astrocytes, and when pyruvate is produced in excess of that needed for oxidative phosphorylation, it is converted to lactate. So this is, or can be, a natural phenomenon because of this high level of glucose uh, utilization in the brain. So there is extra glucose available. And another important pathway, so since we have uh, quite a lot of glucose available, a pathways for brain glucose utilization, which I think is important, and I will come back briefly later on in terms of the mechanisms of, of brain damage after trauma, is the pentose phosphate pathway which can be considered a, a, a buffer to reduced oxygen. And you will see later that there is quite a lot of oxygen, and not only, not all, not all, not all sorry, oxygen is good, because there are quite a lot of oxidative uh, processes going on. And so that this molecule here, NADPH, is important to buffer this excessive oxidation. A concept very important, uh, Giuseppe talked about earlier, is the regulation of energy flow. And that's what we call the interplay be between 
vascular, metabolic, and the blood-brain barrier. So you have a neurovascular coupling regulated by vessels, neurometabolic coupling, which is regulated by the interplay between astrocytes and neurons, and neurobarrier coupling, whereby there are transporters in the, um, in the brain which are very important. Briefly, the neurovascular coupling, there are several neurotransmitters, nitric oxide, and also products of activity-dependent neuronal and glial metabolism, and I will talk about lactate, but also other proteins. For the neurometabolic coupling, there are two main concepts. First of all, when you increase neuronal activity, where there is also increased neuronal injury, you have glutamate, which is uh, released and it's uh, increased, and there is a processing, an astrocytic cycling for glutamate being produced and uh, converted to glutamine. And so that glutamine, which can, by the way, be uh, um, uh, measured in extracellular fluid in, in, in humans, glutamine is very important because if you have excess uh, glutamate and the glutamate, gla glutamate gl glutamine cycling is not working, this protein is low. So that having normal or elevated glutamate in the extracellular fluid means that the neurometabolic coupling is working well. And then you have uh, extra glucose produced through glycolysis. And this has been shown several times, particularly by a, a group in, in Lausanne, uh, Pierre Magistretti and Luc Pellerin, where this glucose produced through glycolysis goes to lactate. And lactate, which as you may know, is elevated in the extracellular fluid. So we have more lactate in the extracellular fluid than glucose in the brain. And this lactate is shuttled or transported via specific transporters to neurons where it can be used as aerobic substrate and alternative substrate. And this here summarizes the main transporters, so the neurobarrier coupling. And of course, when there is a barrier here, you can have difficulty in transporting these substrates. And the main transporters are the glucose transporters that can be found in neurons, GLUT3, and in endothelial cell and uh, astrocytes, GLUT1. The transporters for lactate, monocarboxylate transporters, which are found in the astrocyte and neurons, and the glutamate transporters. So it's very important to know that if you have a troubles in blood-brain barrier, this can go uh, wrong. Now, a word about alternative energetic substrates. I told you that the brain really relies on glucose in normal situations. But just a, a word about ketone bodies, because breastfed neonates do not use glucose, they use ketone bodies acetoacetate and 3-hydroxybutyrate, because there is quite a lot of lipids in breast milk. And if you go on starvation and in diabetic patients, since there is enhanced lipid catabolism, you can use ketone bodies to give energy to the brain. And then lactate. Why lactate? Because I've, I've shown you the extra or excess glucose production in the brain, and so that lactate can be used as a substrate. Uh, this is a, an experiment in, in vitro, where you have primary cultures of neurons in a medium containing glucose and lactate, and so that you can analyze the spectra using NMR spectroscopy study, which is now uh, used um, in alternative to PET scan and then determine the rela relative contribution of glucose versus lactate metabolism. And you have it here, lactate in normal concentration, you have uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, 50% of glucose, then glycolytic li lactate is still 30%, and exogenous lactate. And when you see is that when you increase lactate in the 
in the medium you have basically lactate which is used, so exogenous lactate. And lactate can be a preferential substrate in certain conditions. And if you induced again uh, in vitro in animal uh, hypoxia and then re-oxygenate re the, the hippocampal slices here, lactate contributes for quite a lot of, uh, um, in terms of, of survivals of the neurons. And you see here, if you block glycolysis, still lactate can rescue these uh, cells from, um, from death. And this is a demonstration of the role of lactate. And a very nice review here showing the glial and oglial and neuronal control of brain blood flow. And when you have a low oxygen condition, lactate produced by glycolysis is very important in uh, regulating uh, blood flow and actually in these conditions acts as uh, a vasodilator. This is a recent contribution to the field showing that tra lactate transporters are essentials for long-term memory formation. So if you delete the transport of lactate these mice goes un go under amnesia and very interestingly you can rescue amnesia by administrating lactate but not glucose. So that it seems that in certain conditions, particularly after a lesion or uh, an injury, lactate works together with glucose, these two substrates, to provide energy to neurons and so uh, rescue cells from injury. And that's a demonstration in, uh, in humans, in normal subjects, where if you infuse plasma lactate, 60% of this lactate is utilized by the brain. So that again, lactate is not uh, only a, a, a bad substrate. And uh, um, an ultimate demonstration from the group of Cambridge, where I've shown you right now uh, mainly PET scans and, uh, and MRI spectroscopy. We'll talk this afternoon about cerebral microdialysis where you can sample extracellular fluids from uh, the brain of, of, of patients. And so you can assess uh, uh, main uh, brain metabolites uh, in extracellular fluid. And what this uh, group did is that they infused lactate through the microdialysis probe. And this lactate was labeled with uh, C13. And then they analyzed the spectra using spectroscopy, m &R. And what they demonstrated is that lactate infusions, infusion produces a peak in lactate, showing that lactate is utilized, but also in glutamine. And if you remember, glutamine is very important because the glutamate glutamine cycle. And so this is a demonstration of aerobic lactate utilization after traumatic brain injury. And this is important because it's also found in, uh, in patients. And the last uh, few minutes of my presentation showing that by combining microdialysis with FTG PET, FTG PET can be used to assess uh, glucose utilization but what you see in this slide is that there is a relationship between glucose consumption and lactate in the, uh, in the microdialysis. And this correlates also with pyruvate. So lactate and pyruvate, we uh, normally uh, have now a sort of, of, of rule of, of uh, having, when you talk about uh, microdialysis, for example, as a lactate to pyruvate ratio. But lactate and pyruvate are important to be assessed independently, separately, because it, it's not only, uh, lactate may not only be bad. And what you see here is that this is not ischemia. So this is not an ischemic lactate. This is an hyperglycolytic lactate, so that you have an increase in, in glucose consumption which parallel with lactate elevation and pyruvate elevation 
in the extracellular fluid. And this is uh, another very nice and important demonstration of a patient with subdural hematoma where you have uh, using FDG PET again in increasing the signal. So you have increased glucose utilization, but by in parallel measuring blood flow using Xenon CT, the author found no cerebral ischemia. So that again, cerebral hyperglycolysis is there, and probably this pathological phenomenon is due to other mechanisms than hypoxia. And, and again, there is clinical observation that energy flow control and energy dysfunction uh, may be involved. And for example, in this, in this uh, paper, a higher brain lactate uptake correlated with better long-term outcome. And by, by Paul Vespa showing here metabolic crisis, what metabolic crisis without brain ischemia means, it means that lactate to pyruvate ratio correlated strongly and in inversely with CMR oxygen, as shown previously by Nino, but that the oxygen extraction fraction was actually high. There was no correlation with CMR glucose. So what it shows here uh, is that this patient had energy failure due to lack of main energy substrates <laughs> supply. And so there are two main energy metabolic patterns, aerobic metabolism, where glucose is converted to pyruvate, then to lactate. You have elevation in glutamate, which goes with elevation in glutamine, versus, and this pattern is a cerebral hyperglycolysis, where the metabolic need is met, and you have neuronal survival, versus anaerobic metabolism, where glucose, pyruvate, and lactate uh, are actually, you have lactate in excess, you have glutamate in excess, and you don't have uh, the ability to produce in parallel glutamine and pyruvate, and this is a cerebral hypoxic pattern with metabolic failure and neuronal loss. So I think that these two patterns are very important also in terms of clinical uh, practice and application, and again showing that these two substrates, lactate and glutamine, are also very important. I think I'd, with that and some difficulties with the computer, I will conclude. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>